gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Heiss, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And listen, whether, whether the number is 1 percent, 5 percent, or as you mentioned, up to 50 percent, the, the question is, and the issue is, we all know it doesn't take but a small number of radical terrorists to create an enormous problem uh, around the world. Uh, wherever they may strike. So with that in mind, Mr. Jasser, let me begin with you. How important a role does violent jihad play in the uh, Muslim brother Brotherhood ideology? Well, I think it's central, and they've never, they might con condemn certain tactics here or there, but at the end of the day, uh, their motto has remained uh, advocating for violent jihad. Uh, their uh, be prepared passage uh, from the Quran is simply a battle that they use as the rallying cry. So at the end of the day, they are a jihadist organization that believes in the technique of violence as one of the avenues to be used. Okay, so let's look at an example of that. How did uh, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood treat religious minorities, say Coptic Christians? I was there in 2013, and, and uh, they committed, and their leaders and imams called for acts of violence uh, upon Christian communities, upon the Coptic community. And while there may have been some debate here or there, uh, there was impunity uh, given to uh, various Islamist uh, leaders that call for those acts of violence. And uh, especially after they lost power in 2013, uh, it became no holds bar, and it's been that way since. All right, so let's bring it closer to home. Uh, what kinds of activities uh, does the Muslim Brotherhood engage in here in the United States? Do we know what's happening here? What kind of plans, or uh, what can you tell me with that? We, we've, I, look, I, I have to say I'm not an expert on the Muslim Brotherhood here in the United States. I've been more focused on the, the, uh, the splinter groups and affiliate groups abroad. But what we can say is certain groups have been uh, involved in terror finance cases. We have seen examples of this. The Holy Land Foundation, for example, is sort of a famous one. That was a, an organization that was providing $12 million to Hamas over the course of about a decade. Uh, and uh, the Muslim Brotherhood group CARE was uh, an unindicted co-conspirator in that case. It had an unspecified role uh, in, in that case. So we've seen uh, examples of this in recent history. Uh, but again, I think the important thing to note here is that uh, you know, we need to see a certain criteria in order to designate them. In some cases, we just might see examples of troubling behavior. And this is where I think we need to, I mean, I, you know, with all respect to all of my panelists, we need to be looking simply at the criteria not uh, you know, uh, how troubled we are about a certain ideology. We need to be look. There is a, tr a criteria in the U.S. government for designation. We go after those groups in the U.S. that are in violation of our law, and we continue to watch those that may be tr uh, exhibiting some troubling behavior. Okay, thank you. But by your own admission, you're not an expert of this in the United States. So Dr. Jazzer, let me go back to you. What other radical uh, Islamic movements outside of the Muslim Brotherhood should we be concerned about here in the United States? Well, it's interesting, actually, um, if you look, for example, at the Khomeini's Hezbollah, Hezbollah was designated a terror organization. We had sanctions against Iran for, for decades. That's one of the reasons there haven't been as many acts of Shia-inspired radical. It's not because the Hezbollah or the Khomeini's in Iran love America. They chant death to America all the time. But the sanctions and the inability to fund and build mosques like the AKP now is building in Maryland and elsewhere, like uh, the funneling of money from Saudi Arabia. I mean, up until just a few months ago, Saudi Arabia was actually intimately involved in the spread of the Brotherhood into Europe and in the West. So if you look at our own national security incidents, San Bernardino, Boston bombing, Awlaki. Awlaki came through the Muslim Student Association, which was part of the motherships of the Muslim Brotherhood history, progeny here in the United States, that then evolved. Now, Awlaki then left the Brotherhood ideology to become a Salafi jihadist and join Al-Qaeda and go to Yemen. But that revolving door of ideology, if you look at the radicalization of a lot of Islamists in the United States that go from the belt, the, the conveyor belt, of nonviolent sort of political, anti-American, anti-Semitic political Islam that go towards radicalization, it often starts with Brotherhood legacy groups in America. And I'll tell you, as a Syrian American, the Syrian American Council is one of the central parts of that. Its own leadership has said its affiliation with the Brotherhood in Syria is one of the reasons the United States ended up funding a lot of radical Islamist groups, including Jabhat al-Nusra, Ahrar al-Sham, and other radical groups in Syria because of Muslim Brotherhood sympathizers in the United States that told them, oh, they're okay. And, and you can find this by doing research 
by looking at their Facebook social media posts that sympathize with those groups in Syria. Thank you. Could, could you provide this committee with a list of all those? Absolutely. It's in my written testimony that was submitted, sir. Okay. All of them? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Rice, um, I believe just to uh, expand on uh, uh, Dr. Chanzer's testimony, there hasn't been a prosecution uh, in the United States of a Hamas affiliate since the Holy Land Foundation. Is that correct, Jonathan? Uh, there, no, I don't believe there has been. And that was in the late 90s? That was early 2000s. Okay. Early 2000s. My point being simply that the Department of Justice and the Treasury Department uh, are watching uh, uh, um, potential terrorist activity uh, and the FBI, of course, very, very vigorously. And I think that the, uh, the paucity of prosecutions tells a, a very important story about the lack of activity uh, going on in the United States at this time. I, I'd like to respond to that for just a moment because I, I don't think that that actually captures the full picture. Uh, there has not been a designation of a U.S. charity here in the United States since 2009. Okay, what it means is, is that we have a problem with, this, with the system, that we're not looking at charities, we're not looking at the nonprofits that could be in violation of our laws. I actually believe that during the Obama administration, not to make this political, but during those years, the fact that we did not have a designation to me is very troubling because I don't believe that there was no terror finance activity coming out of the US. So that does not exonerate the Muslim Brotherhood. To me, it seems as if the system was not working for the last decade, and I'm hoping that we get to see a reinvigoration of that system now. Thank you right. for that gentlemen, answer. And gentlemen's agree. time's expired. Uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin for five minutes.